Okay, ready to go. All right. Well, thanks for joining um, for this lunchtime seminar. Um, and my name is Tianjin Li, and I will be, I was asked actually to present um, the new Cochrane handbook. And what's new, you know, what is the, what are the latest methodologies that we're trying to push in. Um, and I have a copy of the book here, if you want to take a look. Uh, but I will just go through a few highlights from the book. Um, and I served as one of the associate editors for the book, as you can see. And I give all the slides credit to Professor Julian Higgins, who is the editor, senior editor for the book. And I've obviously borrowed a lot of these slides. Uh oh how do I go to the next slide? Uh, shall I use the, how do I go to the next slide? Should I use the computer or? Feedback here. Um, I think you have control over slide. I don't. Oh, you don't? Um, oh, here we go. Um, so the, the this version of the handbook really was put together with efforts from many people. Actually, more than a hundred authors contributed materials to this version of the handbook. Here I'm showing you the senior editors, the photo we took at the last colloquium with all the editors as well as Miranda who were not able to join us. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Cochrane process and may have used the Cochrane handbook in the past, there have been many, many versions. And the first version was published um, in 1994 and the, um, edited by David Sackett who passed away a couple of years ago. And since then, there has been many different versions of updates, including minor updates, as well as the major updates. And you may have a hard copy of the book, the blue one in the background. So that was the last version published in print, and that was published in 2008. So that version of the handbook has been cited by over 50,000 times, and only about 5,000 times were cited by Cochrane Systematic Reviews. So what I'm trying to say is this book is sort of like industry standard for doing systematic reviews, if you, um, and it has been used uh, mostly actually by people outside of the Cochrane rather than inside of the Cochrane. So here we have the latest version. So after more than 12 years, we have the second printed version. And what, before I came here, I actually searched on Amazon. If you want a copy, you can get it from Amazon. So you can either get a digital version of it or get a hard copy. And, and also you can rent from Amazon, interesting in, uh, enough. Um, so in terms of the steps of conducting a systematic review, you may be quite familiar with it. And the reason I brought this up is really to show you how the core methods of the handbook, describing the handbook, um, you know, sort of uh, matches with the steps in completing a systematic review and describes each step of the way. So in, in doing a systematic review, you, you first start by formulating a research question. And you probably would agree with me, that's the hardest thing to do. And if you don't get the research question right, you probably won't be able to deliver a high quality systematic review that actually addresses a very important clinical question. And then you work with the information specialist to look for all the relevant evidence. Um, and then you screen those records and abstract the data, assess the risk of bias and synthesizing the results and finally write the reports. So those are sort of the major steps of completing a systematic review. And this matches pretty well with the, this is not going forward. The contents of the handbook. So the handbook has four parts. The first part is really online and it's everything you need to know about Cochrane and how to initiate a Cochrane systematic review. And the second part really um, is the core methods and those methods are applicable to any systematic review, Cochrane or non-Cochrane. And then the part three and part four are different perspectives and also talks, talks about uh, selective topics that are relevant to some reviews but not to all the reviews. So here I marked all the chapters that are brand new from this version of the handbook. Again, only part one is online and all the other parts are in this book. Um, so for example, there's a new um, chapter on effect measures, there's a new chapter on network meta-analysis, which I will talk about. 
there's a new chapter about uh, synthesis, uh, synthesis using other methods, meaning when you cannot do any meta-analysis or you cannot do any quantitative synthesis, what are the methods you can use? And then there's a new chapter about bias due to missing results. And we have been using the terminology reporting bias, publication bias in the past, but now we have formalized in using the term bias due to missing results. And also you can see there are other topics, for example, the risk of bias in non-randomized studies and how to assess those, and then complexity in systematic reviews. In addition to these one, two, three, four, nine new chapters, there are five other chapters that underwent substantial major updates, um, including determining the scope and the questions and how to group your studies for synthesis and the risk of bias assessment for randomized control trials and others. Um, there's different formats available if you want to get access to the book. Um, the Wiley book, the printed version, as I said, is available from Amazon. You can get a hard copy, but you don't have to. So everything is free. All the materials are free from the um, Cochrane website. All you need to do is to Google Cochrane Handbook. will take you to the um, website. You can browse all the materials from the handbook online. If you have a if you are a Cochrane author, meaning that you have a Cochrane um, Archie account, you can download PDFs um, for each chapter of the handbook. So depending on your access or your affiliation uh, with Cochrane, you can access the book in different ways. And personally, I like to have a hard copy and also browse the uh, materials online because where there you can actually put in a keyword and search um, terms you're looking for. Um, and the PDFs are really, really helpful for teaching, in my view. Um, and what's also new for this version of the handbook is the methodological expectations of Cochrane intervention reviews are incorporated as part of the materials. So I'm just going to pass this around if you want to take a look, meaning that uh, of the core methods under, underneath, um, towards the end of each section and subsections, there will be methodological expectations. So these are like embedded as part of the systematic review, which sort of set the standards where you need to be in order to publish in Cochrane and also in other major journals. Um, and I'm going to spend a few minutes to talk about really the new things, the new materials that come out from this handbook. And this is a handout prepared by the editorial team. Um, the first thing is really planning the review. I don't know how many of you, you probably all have experience working on systematic reviews or teaching systematic reviews. And what usually surprised the first timer is, oh, I, I planned this PICO. This is the PICO I'm going, to af going after, the population intervention comparison and outcome. But not necessarily the PICO you end up having in the final review, because you, know, you either don't have the evidence for some of the outcomes, or you may have to group some of, uh, some of the interventions. For example, if you're interested in drug comparisons, right? The drug may come in different uh, dosage, different um, you know, frequency of use, and they may be used in competition with other non-drug therapies. So you sort of have to make some decisions along the way to group your PICO for a synthesis. So here, the new chapter really separate, you know, set the stage. What is the PICO you're after at the protocol stage? And then what are the data you actually have in the process of collecting the data and how you're going to group all the PICO for your synthesis? And then lastly, so what are the studies actually ended up in your systematic review? So here, the PICOs, we have the review PICO. So those are the PICO you planned at the protocol stage. So those are the PICO on which the eligibility of the studies is based on. And then you have the pro, um, PICO for each synthesis, and you plan, you plan the comparisons, including the intervention, comparator groups, and grouping of outcomes and population subgroups. And I, I gave you some examples of different doses of the drug. You can imagine if you're looking at behavior intervention, there could be you know, counseling, there could be you know, interaction, you know, counseling and non-counseling could be counseling versus other types of behavior intervention. So you have to make some decisions along the way. So that's the PICO for synthesis. And lastly, the PICO for the included studies is really what comes out from your systematic review. Those are determined at the review stage and what was actually investigated in the included studies. You may want to know, you may want, you, you might be interested in the comparison between a delivery system versus the drug without the delivery system. But what actually being done in clinical trial is delivery system versus placebo. So how would you, summarize that information. So that's like PICO of the included studies. 
and just a few uh, more words about these information. In terms of summarizing the included studies and preparing for synthesis, I mean, when I was teaching uh, systematic reviews to graduate students, I found that sort of the step was not well explained in the previous version of the handbook. You know, the, you know, the students collected all the data from trials and they always pause and then now what? You know, now what? So here is now what? You first summarize the characteristics of each studies. Those are your characteristics of included studies table. And then you have to determine which studies are similar enough to be grouped. We need each comparison, right, by looking across all those tables. And then you have to de determine whether you have data for any quantitative synthesis, right? And then determine if you have to go back and change your protocol if there's nothing you can synthesize, or perhaps you made the wrong decision because you don't know the evidence good enough. And then you synthesize all this information. I mean, I use the term qualitative synthesis, which is really the meat of a systematic review, because you know the data the best. If you don't, you know, sort of talk about them and describe them and provide a very thoughtful overarching description of the evidence, no one else will know what you're talking about. And then the last bit, the, uh, st uh, stage three, is the synthesis itself. Okay. And the second new thing of the handbook is really the new risk of bias tool, um, and they call ROB2. And there's also the Robbins I, which is the risk of bias tool for assessing um, in non-interventional studies for e effectiveness of intervention. And then there's a new chapter about the bias due to missing results. And I think probably ROB2 um, is an area where most of our Cochrane authors will struggle quite a bit when they implement in their systematic review, because it's a quite new framework of thinking about bias, although very similar to the previous tool. Um, and then Robin's Eye, both the ROB2 and Robin's Eye are based on the causal inference framework. So I'm going to say a few words about these. So previously, the risk of bias tool, you know, there's only one tool and people adapt the tool to their own needs for from the parallel group randomized controlled trials to crossover trials to cluster randomized group uh, trials. And now we have individual tool for each of the study design. And for Robin Sai, really is for observational studies. So one of the criticisms that Cochrane received over the years is, you know, Cochrane is too restricted to only look at randomized controlled trials. So now, you know, Cochrane is saying, well, you're more than welcome to include non-randomized control studies as long as you know how to assess the risk of bias and make sure your interpretation of the totality of the evidence accounts for the de design limitations of, of, of observational study. So the Robin's eye is really for assessing the observational data. So the follow-up studies are what we, you know, the cohort studies. And then the before-after studies are, you know, when you have a measurement before the intervention, measurement after the intervention, how would you consider the bias in those type of studies? And then there are controlled before and after studies, the same design, but now all of a sudden you have a comparison group. And I have not used the Robin's Eye in my own work, um, so I'm not going to talk about that, although I know it quite a bit. But I will focus on the differences of this version of the ROB2, which is the risk of bias in the randomized controlled trials, and how is it similar or different from the previous version. So the purpose of doing a randomized controlled trial is really have a fair comparison of your interventions, right? So you randomize participants, and you, well, you should use a true random sequence rather than the date of birth or rather than the date that they come to visit. And then you have to conceal that sequence from the participants. So you have to hide that sequence until the patient is enrolled and you're re ready to allocate them to the treatment and control group. And then you want to blind or mask the participants and the experimenters so the treatment are implemented faithfully. Um, and then hopefully there's no omissions from the analysis. So first of all, there's no missing data. You know, everyone has all the measurements. Um, and then in analysis, you're using correct approach to account for missing data. And then in terms of the outcome, you want blinded assessment, meaning that you know, it's uh, as objective as possible, and then your determination of the final status of the participant is not influenced by whether you know they received the intervention or not. And lastly, you want the honest reporting, right? Whatever you find in the study, you have to report all of them to avoid or minimize reporting bias or publication bias. So this is why we do a randomized controlled trial. As you can see, if you screw up every, any way, you know, uh, any step through this process, you will introduce bias. So that's sort of the framework for the risk of bias tool. tool. 
So there's a bias arising from the randomization process. So that's one domain. The bias due to deviations from the intended intervention. So that's when you cannot deliver the intervention or people did not adhere to the intervention. And thirdly, there's bias due to missing outcome data, right? So that um, after you deliver the intervention. And then there's bias in the measurement of the outcome. So that's the blinding of the blinded assessment of the outcome. And lastly, there's a bias in the selection of the reported results. So here are really the five domains for the new ROP2 um, tool. Um, and then you form an overall assessment of the overall risk of bias. Any questions so far? So I think this is sort of a, a different, very similar, but slightly more um, um, framed word, way of thinking about the bias. So yes, yeah, so the non-randomized studies. Also summarize bias. Well, because previously they recommended uh, evaluating randomized trial, trial separately and non-randomized studies separately. Yeah. Then how to put together all this way. Or currently it's possible, for example, if you have some randomized and non-randomized non study and you want to evaluate level of final evidence, mm -hmm. then maybe it would make sense to summarize all of them. So wow. this is really the tool for randomized controlled trials. For non-randomized studies, the tool is called Robin's Eye. The, the, the other tool, which is also a new chapter in the book. In terms of, so you have to apply, first of all, the first step is really apply the appropriate tool to different study design. Okay. And then secondly, when you have done that, how do you summarize this data together, right? So I think there are two issues. One is do you do statistical analysis by combining the randomized st studies from non-randomized studies? And I usually do the stratified analysis first without combining them. And secondly, if you decide to combine them or without combining them, when you talk about the overall confidence in the evidence or overall certainty in the evidence, you have to account for the study design issues. So you have to account for the risk of bias. So the interpretation is still very similar, but where the non-randomized studies obviously usually are more susceptible to biases, you, so you have less confidence in that type of data. Did I answer your question? Yes, yeah, the question, how much, how much confidence, for example, if, for example, we have 10 studies, and you may have three randomized studies and seven non. So we may have seven randomized studies and three non randomized studies. Then, when we evaluate final level of evidence, mm -hmm. how would we uh, take into consideration this uh, deviation? Yeah. yeah. High so, quality studies. So it's this, the, the question is when you have both uh, randomized studies and non-randomized studies and how you account for both in your interpretation of the result. And I, I think it's very similar how you would interpret there are 10 randomized controlled trials. The same thing, right? You may have three at high quality, seven at low quality, and you still have to... For example, if you have just three randomized studies, for example, 30 percent, then we may say the line of the other evidence. Or if you have eight randomized studies, good quality. But mm -hmm. again, randomized study also may be good quality. And exactly. Good quality. Yeah. So the question is how to put everything together, taking into the consideration quality of the my study and uh, level of evidence of enough yeah, I, I think there are generally guidance for how to do it. Like, for example, the great framework, and you can, so the great framework risk of bias is one domain, right? So the observational studies will add higher risk of bias on average or in general, right? So you will downgrade your level of evidence. So that's like general framework. But when you apply to individual question, I don't think I can answer you the question whether there's a formula of interpreting there are seven <laughs> observational studies versus three randomized controlled trials, because they could be all high quality, 
right? And then you don't need to downgrade your certainty of evidence. Or they could be all in low quality, then you have to downgrade. But again, this is not under my study, then that Yeah, so the Robin's Eye tool is really trying to imagine a hypothetical randomized control trials. So that's like the framework. And then looking at the observational study in front of you, how likely this observational study is trying to estimate the effectiveness of intervention by mapping it back to a randomized controlled trial. So, I mean, you, I don't know if you're familiar with the causal inference literature, but there are a lot of work has been done where they're trying to design an observational study really mimicking a hypothetical imaginary clinical trial. So the more you can do that, the less of a selection bias there will be, right? And the question is, do we really know from, a real, from any observational study whether there, it's free of selection bias? Since it's not randomized, we can never say it's free of a selection bias, but you probably have you know, sort of a range of rating in terms of how likely the selection bias may affect your result. So that's the framework of Robin's eye. Um, Yes. So the book does have a chapter on how to do that. Because if that's your question. Last week I sent you to you. Mm -hmm. Specifically, uh, this problem. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, I can provide recommendations now, but now mm -hmm. how to manage their name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if that's what you're looking for, certainly use the handbook. There is a chapter on how to think about the non-randomized study. Okay. Can I have that book? And then we'll yes, point it to you. So it's uh, chapter 24. Um, sorry for about the discussion that's sort of not related to ROP2. Um, so a couple of things you need to keep in mind when you use the ROP2 tool. The first thing is to decide uh, what is the study design. As I mentioned, there are different templates for different study design. Um, the, the, you know, the, the baseline one is sort of for the parallel group trial, and then there's deviations for a crossover trial as well as for class randomized control trial. So make sure you pick the right tool for different study design. And then secondly, unlike the previous tool, you have to specify which, which result is being assessed for risk of bias. So the result here, I mean really like a relative risk and a confidence interval. So it's about an estimate of the treatment effect you're interested in. So um, those you, you should really pick from what you think you're going to put into the summary of findings table if you plan to do, do that. And the third way is to specify the effect of the interest. So are you interested in the effect of assignment to intervention or the hearing to intervention? Again, there are two different, slightly two different versions of the tool for you to choose from. And then specify the sources of information. So the last um, bullet really addresses when we're doing a systematic review, you usually not only have journal papers, you may have conference abstract, you may have trial registration information, and sometimes if you're lucky, you may have internal company reports about the trial. So it's very important to specify the sources of information you have, because depending on where you look, the information, first of all, is inconsistent. Secondly, you know, if you have internal documents that are usually more reliable than the published journal article. So here are the like sort of the, the first page of the tool that asks you about the study design and which outcome is it being assessed and then the numeric result. So again, this is very important. You have to specify the numeric result. Are we talking about the relative risk of 1.52? Where did you get that number from? Or you, know, you have to reference to a table or figure where the result is from. And here is the aim of, you, of the study for assessing the effect effect of assignment to intervention. So that's what we typically mean by intention to treat effect, or are you interested in 
assessing the effect of starting and adhering to the intervention. Again, depending on which box you check, there will be different questions or signaling questions to guide you through this tool. And then here is the, uh, the, the check boxes of uh, the sources of information that you, um, that you use for assessing the risk of bias. Okay. Um, and coming back again, the tool has five domains. Uh, the bias arising from the randomization process, bias due to deviations from intended intervention, missing outcome, measurement of the outcome, and then the bias in the selection of, of the reported results. And differently from the previous version, you have to come up with an overall risk of bias. So by default, the algorithm takes the highest risk of bias of any domain, uh, and that will be your overall risk of bias. However, you can overwrite that default algorithm. Okay? Um, so if there are multiple domains that are at unclear or some concern, new, new, there's no unclear risk of bias anymore. If there are several domains that are, have some concern risk of bias, you may decide the study is at high risk of bias. Okay. So the low risk of bias is really, almost all these domains are at low risk of bias. And that's when you assign low risk of bias, overall risk of bias. So, um, and I'm not going to show you the entire tool, but um, just to alert you that there are a series of signaling questions you answer, and you can answer yes, probably yes, probably no, no, no information. So those are the five default answers. Um, and then the consequences of checking yes or probably yes is the same, meaning that there, um, if I, I will show you the algorithm in the next slide, they sort of lead to the same pathway. And the reason for having yes and probably yes is, you know, people are different. Some people usually, you know, would like to rate things with some uncertainty versus other people who are just very certain about, you know, there's, uh, I'm very sure there's no, um, I, I could answer yes to that question. And then the risk of bias judgment following from the answers to the signaling questions, um, and there's an algorithm and the map is to low risk of bias, some concerns and high risk of bias. So again, they have changed the unclear to some concerns, okay? Um, and I will show you the algorithm on the next slide. So this is right, uh, just one example of the domain one algorithm, the bias arising from the randomization process. And here are all the signaling questions. So the first question is, um, you know, allocation sequence, um, is that concealed? If you answer yes or probably yes, you go to the next question, are the allocation sequence random? You know, if it's yes, you go to baseline imbalance, and then it maps to the risk of bias assessment for each of the domain. And then again, for, from each domain, there are five of them, and you come up with the overall risk of bias assessment. There's an algorithm, but you can always overwrite the algorithm with some rationale and justification. So, so here are the five domains of the risk of bias, and then the signaling questions are in the box, and then you answer yes, probably yes, no, probably no, or no information. You provide the quotes supporting your, just, uh, supporting your um, 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 judgment, and then this all map out as the overall risk of bias. So any question? So Bob, this will be a nightmare for editors. <laughs> Yep. Uh, first of all, not Luckily, all it's the. It's not required yet. Well, it's actually it's required. Almost, is it required? It is required, although uh, for new reviews, not for the not reviews for the that are going. going. The no. Um, first of all, it requires a lot of training. Um, not all the authors are familiar with it. And even with the older version of the tool, we know like people have different interpretation and misunderstood many of the items. And then who is going to check all of this is my question. You know, they can make whatever and the selection of choice and decision they want, but you know, the, the, my, my guess is many of the studies will end up being high risk of bias or some concerns. Yeah, nobody's going to check the high risk of bias. Yeah, oh, that's a good way to do it. <laughs> At least you, you know, sort of uh, um, um, cut down the workload quite a bit. Uh, there is a new chapter on network meta-analysis. That's another topic I'm going to spend a few minutes. Um, so Cochrane is actively encouraging the appropriate use of this, this methodology, both as a standard method of synthesis, uh, synthesis and to make our reviews more useful for decision makers. Um, how many of you have heard of network meta-analysis? 
Okay, so good. Um, so this is a forest plot. You should be familiar with that type of plot comparing two interventions. Um, and the reality is for many in, um, conditions, there are multiple interventions. So actually the, the little figure on the front of the book is a network graph um, where, let me show you with a real example. Um, so this is four interventions for heavy menstrual bleeding. So there's a hysterectomy, there's first generation hystero, uh, hysteroscopic <coughs> techniques and second generation technique and then marina. So those are all the interventions, um, options you can choose for this particular condition, which is heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, and, you know, when they're randomized controlled trials, they usually compare a pair of interventions, or sometimes three, but rarely all of them. Um, so we plot all these trials on this figure, what I call like a network graph, where, you know, the, the solid line really shows you there are randomized controlled trial, trials comparing the two. Um, the thickness of the, of the edge is really proportional. You could either proportional to number of trials or to the number of participants. But in this case, it's number of trials. And the size of the node is how many ran, uh, participants were randomized to that intervention. So this really shows you there are four trials. Uh, no, not four trials. Four interventions, but hysterectomy has never been compared to Marina, and hysterectomy has, has never been compared to the second generation technique. Um, and then the real question facing many of the decision makers is, I'm not interested in two, I want to know four of them. I want to know the comparative effectiveness of all these interventions for this co same condition and in terms of its effectiveness, in terms of um, if we want to rank them, you know, which one will be ranked the best and which one will be ranked the second best, so on and so forth. So network meta-analysis is a statistical te technique that facilitates this type of analysis. So you can derive the relative effectiveness of any two interventions in a single analysis. And after you run the analysis, you get some results like this. So if we only look at the upper half, so those are the pairwise meta-analysis. That's when you don't know how to do network meta-analysis, you will have a table like that, where you have the estimate comparing marina versus first generation hysterectomy, right? because there are trials, so you do meta-analysis, just pairwise meta-analysis by combining all those trials to get an estimate. So each cell shows you the pairwise estimate, um, but if you don't do a network meta-analysis, you would never get an estimate between hysterectomy versus second generation technique or hysterectomy versus marina, right? Because those were not compared in trials. So that's what you typically do under the pairwise meta-analysis framework. And under the network meta-analysis framework, where information actually flows through the whole entire network, you can get all these indirect estimates between hysterectomy, marina, and the second generation technique. And the idea behind the analysis is very simple. So it says, if you, based on trials, randomized controlled trials, if you know A is better than placebo, however, B is worse than placebo, can you say something about A and B? So that's the idea. And it's a very simple idea, although it relies on very strong assumptions. So I'm not going to get into the um, statistical details, but I have to say for all the Cochrane reviews I have to deal with, for most part, there are multiple interventions and network meta-analysis is probably the more appropriate uh, statistical approach to analyzing the data rather than all these pairwise things. Uh, one of the most recent reviews we updated, which just came out last week, was um, all these interventions to slow progression of myopia in children. There are bifocal lenses, trifocal lenses, single focal lenses, contact lenses, soft contact lenses, rigid contact lenses, outdoor activity. You know, there are like more than 10 types of interventions. And the, we started as a pairwise meta-analysis where the, the conclusions are just, you know, based on two interventions, but it really sort of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, for any parents or for any practitioners, what they really want to know is tell me just one thing rather than all this pairwise thing that you cannot draw any coherent conclusion. So, so the, for the next version, we, we've published the update as a pairwise meta-analysis, but we're embuckling on a network meta-analysis where hopefully we'll be able to draw more coherent conclusions amongst all these interventions. So this is a, like a brand new chapter and is a core method and we're encouraging authors to do more network meta-analysis when the question is really about the comparative effectiveness of more than two interventions. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah, sure. So, um, so you're statistically yeah. carrying things up yeah. where there are no studies for. 
Yeah, has anybody ever tested that? Like to see if, you know, statistically it says, you know, the second generation should be yeah. better than the hysterectomy. Yeah, but has so anybody how can actually I go tested back? that? Um, so that's a very good question. And the question is, you know, you're drawing indirect inference when there are no trials. And uh, statistically, how do you know whether that's valid or not? So you're, you're touching upon the assumptions for all these analyses. Um, so, I mean, I just, I was showing you that there's no direct evidence, but you can imagine for the comparison between, for example, the first and second generation, there are trials, right? You can also compare those two through the Moringa, right? So that sort of provides both indirect evidence and direct evidence where you can use the direct evidence to validate the indirect evidence. So that's the assumption underlying this whole analysis. So if the indirect evidence through Marina is very different from your RCT evidence, then you may not want to do any analysis like that because that tells you there's something different. These trials may not be comparable, for example. But if they're very consistent, you know, I'm talking about consistency, in a statistical way, and then you probably feel quite comfortable combining both the indirect and indirect evidence. So that's the idea. So, yeah, so you do have to check all the assumptions yeah. for the analysis. Um, so, um, I found this chapter very useful, which is about intervention complexity. We don't talk about them a, a lot when we're looking at drugs. Um, but actually, for many of the interventions, there are multiple dimensions, multiple components, um, and then the different components may interact within each other, and then they are being applied in very complex systems. So how to think through all of this? Can you draw a logical model for you to tease apart which component of the intervention actually works um, or work better when they put together? So that's like a new chapter about intervention complexity. Um, and lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about, since we're all in this big data and AI sort of um, era, uh, how we're doing uh, as a field of doing evidence synthesis. Are we using any of the text mining and new technology to facilitate the, um, the, the production of systematic reviews? So the answer is yes. Uh, there's a chapter about all different software you can use to support systematic reviews. I think this will be quite useful for people who come to you for, you know, recommendations of software and they actually have a catalog of all these different software. For example, Abstractor, Covidence, you know, library has Covidence and Distiller, Epi Reviewer, and all of these. And they sort of have a little description of how they're comparing to each other and the strengths and weaknesses of each. Um, and then in terms of automating the study selection process, so the, the study shows that the RCT classifiers works pretty well um, because we have so many labeled, um, you know, sort of records in PubMed that can be used as a training set for figuring out whether a record is RCT or not. Um, but that's how far we are. <laughs> We're not quite there yet to using the, the, the machine learning um, for you to completely screen, you know, all the search results from um, uh, a systematic review. But it has shown to be very useful for updating. Again, you need a big training set. Once you have the training set, the updating can be quite handy using some of the machine learning methods. Um, so just to, to, you know, wrap it up, you know, I'm here. Um, I moved the Cochrane Eyes and Vision, the United States um, group here um, from Hopkins. And, and Dr. Kay Dickerson used to be the director for CV US for the past 12 years. And we have been lucky to have been funded by the National Eye Institute for more than 12 years. Um, and the, the people I'm here, Narash is the chair of the ophthalmology department, who is a co-investigator on the grant. Sam is here, who is a methodologist. We have Sweco, who is working remotely. And the remaining staffs are still based at Hopkins with a subcontract back to Hopkins. Um, and here is what we do. You know, we do a lot of training, build a comparative effectiveness research network. We partner with professional societies, academic centers, journals to ensure that knowledge underpinning clinical practice is reliable. Uh, we prepare systematic reviews. So this is where we spend most of our FTE. We have to publish 15 reviews and updates every year. Uh, we do a lot of fundamental methodological research, 
um, for example, related to network meta-analysis, related to guidelines, related to patient reported outcomes. And lastly, we hope to disseminate our work as broadly and widely as possible. So sort of as a wrap up of why I'm here, um, and I would like to take questions if there's any. And how long do you think it will take to update the handbook with the app? Oh, I think Julian is quitting. <laughs> <laughs> Another 10 years. 10 years. Yeah, this, this from the previous version is 12 years. Um, and I don't think there's any support at the moment. Well, this one was just published last year. Let's not talk about updates. <laughs> Let's use it for a couple more years until it's out of date. Yeah. It was really great to hear your summary of Rob 2 and the network map analysis. This is your yeah. level of anxiety, these things. And this is yeah. Um, is there any hot button issue in the book that needs updating already? Um, I, I think it's pretty up to date. I mean, I think the whole um, AI and NLP natural language processing in that field is moving very fast. Um, we're not quite there yet, um, but hopefully in another 10 years, we'll be writing a very different book uh, about evidence synthesis. Like hopefully, you know, some of the data extraction can be done automatically. Risk of bias assessment can be done by Lisa's project. <laughs> you know, so hopefully uh, we're getting closer to not fully automate, but at least to semi-automate as much as we can about the systematic review production process. Um, I don't think the synthesis can be uh, done by machine. Um, that's where, you know, really the human input is very important. Um, yeah, but yeah, thinking about how much literature is out there, um, you know, the, the whole business of systematic review needs to be sustainable by itself. And given how little funding we have for this, we, we have to be really uh, thinking about creative solutions to the problem. Um, so I saw the chapter uh, include um, maybe six, seven pages on perspective meta analysis. Yeah. How that section was written, do you know that? Ha, ah, that was the <laughs> section actually does not need a lot of update because since the previous chapter was published, there's only one perspective systematic review ever published in the Cochrane Library. So it's not a very popular approach. Um, but it does sort of it came about when you know you're planning trials, when you're like also trialist, you're doing all these trials, you're planning a meta-analysis prospectively. And it's quite helpful for um, in the uh, setting of the industry funded trials where you know you can do that prospectively. Um, but um, and also working with academic trialists to, to get all these trials sort of you know what's going on as soon as the trial results are out there you would include it into your systematic review of meta-analysis but in reality it requires a lot of coordination it has only been applied once in the Cochrane library I, I think probably what's more popular is all these living systematic reviews and all of that and whenever I hear the word living, I'm like, I don't want my review to be a living systematic review just because of the workload, unless there's an automatic way of updating some of it. And I was uh, having a conversation with someone, oh, do you want to pick, pick, keep your network meta analysis as a living network meta analysis? Mm -hmm. I said, you know, it took us five years to get 114 trials together last time. I absolutely don't want to keep this as a living network meta analysis. Yeah. Yeah, as a member of this uh, perspective meta analysis um, yeah. work group yeah. for several years. So I saw NIH founded um, some um, on this um, specific approach. Yeah. My own theory was on this area, but it was not funded. For <coughs> so it's the system, I fear um, the fear may have lost need because if we don't plan earlier, standardize earlier, we always come to discuss the bias. Yeah, I mean, I tried grants on standardizing outcomes, like um, core outcome set type of grants. Um, yeah, it's hard to, in the US, and it's different culture and mindset. Um, people don't want to be told what to do. They feel like using core outcome set is limiting 
creativity limiting the development and you know um, all those things so yeah so that's the challenge thank you the global side uh, the the group leading that effort in australia yeah yeah. What was the topic of that prospective? I don't remember. Yeah, but I was sort of coordinated a little bit of the the chapter, the updating that chapter. So I worked a little bit with them. But yeah, that's when I got to know there was only one mm -hmm. published. So so you are you were the major author for that. I'm not an author, I'm the editor for that section. The, the, yeah. Who was the author that you share with? Oh yeah, you can so feel section, free to the section. So I think it's from Australia. Um yeah. Yeah, you are more than welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to browse yeah. it if you yeah. find the author. And you have a question. I I did you know as the searcher, um, I'm often asked to. Um, so you know, there's there's certainly a lot of bias that could be entered, because it comes at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Um, one thing that I'm almost 100% asked to do, maybe not 100%, 90%, um, is to do English online. Mm. And so, but it's a very difficult mm. uh, thing to overcome yeah. if you can't read uh, uh, papers in another language. Yeah. And so how do you, do you have any recommendation for that? Yeah, so the Cochrane, I mean, the search in chapter, they definitely recommend not to limit your search by dates or by language. Um, but the reality is you can only um, work with the language you know or your review teams know. And previous studies shown that um, German language studies are more likely to be um, non-significant compared to English language studies, but that's one study. And then later on, they have done a few more and they have done a systematic review by including non-English language studies versus without, and it showed that the results are not so different. So that's the best evidence we have is really, it does not, well, for each topic, it's hard to say how much it matters. But overall, that's what the systematic review shows is probably doesn't matter as much as you think, uh, or as we think. Um, I think the best you can do is always try to deal with all the language that the author team can work with and then put a limitation if there are languages you cannot work with, uh, right? That's a, you know, we have five studies in Japanese language and none of us can read, so they're waiting for classification rather than being included. So that's all you can do. Yeah. But the systematic review cited in the book shows that it does, on average, doesn't matter, but doesn't mean for individual topic. Like for some a topic like complementary medicine, if you don't include Chinese, Korean, then you end up with not, in a study, right? Yeah. I have another question. Um, I'm not sure the relationship between, you know, high quality review in this uh, concrete uh, review group with the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Mm -hmm. So I uh, took a, a course last spring and I realized the, um, you know, the documents for some clinical preventive services for child by treatment. I went back their long documents to really uh, to find how they um, incorporate those evidence. I don't feel the, the, the author a team, you know, commissioned by those preventive services task force did the right job in terms of, you know, incorporating that evidence from the publication. Yeah. So what's the, you know, role? Um, yeah. high quality review well i think it's easier to find a low quality systematic review out there than a high quality systematic review unfortunately um, and for a lot of the commission reviews and they're huge topics they're usually more than one research questions and you know and it's difficult to synthesize and then even you know within the same review group for cochrane there are you know more experienced teams versus less experienced teams right and then the quality of work is very different um, so that's why Cochrane tried to standardize as much as possible. Um, I've talked about the methodological expectations embedded into each section. So those are sort of the minimal expectations Cochrane reviews are expected to meet. And the, 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 there's always a question of who is checking, right? So you, as a reader, you did check, you know, how, how they were interpreted and all of that. So to give you credit, but not all the reviewers and editors are 
as careful as that in reading. So, so I think that the I think the bottom line is as a user of the information doesn't matter it's primary information or synthesized information, you have to be very careful about the quality of it and you know just you know read everything with a very critical lens. That's the advice I could give. Thank you so much. And well, thank you for having me. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, well, I have to acknowledge Julia's slides. You know, most of the slides are his. I was